Welcome to Vegan Food and Living's Simply Vegan podcast with me, Holly Johnson, and my co-host, Gabriella Clark. With a new episode live every Tuesday, we discuss the latest vegan news, taste test the newest vegan products, and chat to some of the leading names in veganism. Thanks for joining us and welcome to another episode. How are you today, Gabriella? Good, thank you, Holly. How are you? This is your last uh, recording with us for a while, isn't it? So we're going to miss you. It is. We thought uh, a week before baby's due is probably a good time to to stop, just in case we have any imminent arrivals. So uh, yeah, this will be my last one for a while. So I really miss doing it actually for a bit, but um some other things on my agenda to get through <laughs> yeah definitely yeah I'll miss chatting to you too so this week on the agenda well first of all I just like to ask a favor of our amazing listeners we would really really love for you to vote for us in the British Podcast Awards all you need to do is google British Podcast Awards and go to the listeners choice page and it literally takes five minutes so yeah we will love you forever if you vote for us and support a vegan podcast we thought we'd chat first of all about barbecues because you know we're in July everyone's kind of going al fresco especially with having some covid rules going on so um yeah have you been to any barbecues yet Gabriella have you not really had the the weather for it yeah I mean the weather has been quite mixed but I think in true British style it's summer so we're having a barbecue yeah (laughs) no matter what what's happening with the weather um so yeah I have been to a few actually um how about you what what sort of thing do you go for when you when you do you take stuff yourself are they barbecues with like mainly plant-based friends yeah so the couple I've been to have actually been with entirely plant-based friends and families so um that's made it a lot easier um and actually I find that more enjoyable because you're more what I have found that when everybody is plant-based we're less relying on just using all of the meat kind of substitutes or throwing like a vegan sausage on to mimic the meat sausages that are already on the barbecue um, and doing much more exciting things with barbecuing veg yeah, people get more creative, don't they? And you kind of end up putting a lot more effort into it. Mm. So do you kind of do like what uh, veggie kebabs and things like that? Veggie kebabs, um, really lovely kind of blackened corn on the cob, which um, once it comes off the barbecue, we rub down with a slice of lime and then roll through some chili flakes. Oh, so it's nice. quite spicy um, with some butter as well obviously plant-based butter um the one I was at a couple of weeks ago we also sliced in half some pak choy and put that on the barbecue as well and that barbecued amazingly because it kept its crunchiness it blackened a bit on the leaves but was still really fresh and I think you you crave that alongside all that other kind of potato salad and the bread and the other delicious things you're having at a barbecue it was nice to have some really fresh healthy options as well yeah definitely because I think it's so easy isn't it just kind of go to the supermarket and grab all the process options so yeah definitely makes you feel a lot better in terms of like you know your sort of the health of your stomach anyway after (laughs) not carb loading um I went round to a friend's the other day who has moved into a house nearby um she said it's not a party it's not a party and got there and there was kind of crisps and olives and drinks and and a barbecue and I was like well this kind of looks like a party she's like no 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 not a party she said I got (laughs) I got a load of uh, vegan stuff and I said oh amazing thank you and she'd bought the um the new wicked kitchen kebabs from Tesco so she said oh, yeah do you want garlic and herb or chili and lime and I was like oh well, I don't know I want both of them both, I went, please. Yeah. yeah yeah so I went for the chili and lime really really nice um sort of hot and zesty and they're made from wheat and pea protein I mean obviously it's it is a processed product um but for a little treat at the barbecue it was really nice really nice firm texture um a little bit like I suppose you could describe it a little bit like sausage meat, but it was 
it was definitely like a kofta style kebab mm. um and loads of sort of marinade on it so yeah really like that and i'm going to get the garlic and herb ones i think this weekend to try they're three pound fifty in tesco's at the moment i think it's really great with these new options coming out like those kebabs you know there's a wealth of different types of vegan sausage and burger and stuff it's nice to find that balance between having a couple of those say meat replacements but using the barbecue to really let the veggies sing um like you say kebabs or just really well seasoned flavored veggies that have that different taste by being cooked on a barbecue than you'd normally get cooking them say at home in the oven um is a great way to experiment with different flavors and and get people trying a bit more variety of veg Yeah, I think um, it's the way forward, isn't it? You know, okay, processed foods now and again, but let's really celebrate all the amazing vegetables that especially like in the middle of summer in the UK, you know, we're just, we're kind of spoiled for choice, aren't we? Um, What other kind of natural meat replacements do you use? Do you tend to use like jackfruit or um, banana blossom or anything like that when you're cooking at home? Yeah, so I'd say the two we'd use the most would be jackfruit and then uh, mushrooms um, to mimic a a meaty texture. Um, Mushrooms definitely either shredded or we create um, kebabs with them, like shawarma kebabs with them. And then jackfruit we tend to use in curries um, before the pandemic hit I was traveling around India and we stayed with a family in a homestay um just outside of Kerala and they grew jackfruit in their amazing gardens oh, you've never seen anything like it they were huge these jackfruits just hanging uh, in their garden and we would eat with the family three times a day and the amazing curries that we would have breakfast, lunch and dinner using jackfruit really kind of transformed how I saw it actually. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still kind of learning how to cook with jackfruit. I mean, obviously (laughs) coming up for four years vegan now, I need to, I need to up my game a bit, but yeah, I think because the kids sometimes kind of aren't that keen on it. Mm. I, I sort of end up the tins of jackfruit sort of languishing in my cupboard Um, but yeah I definitely want to experiment with that a bit more I have to say if I saw it on a menu kind of in that that way you usually do which is like a pulled pork version it's definitely not something I would choose to order but in a curry it really soaks up all of the flavors of those spices it works really well as a texture alongside other veg and rice Um, so I much prefer it in that way rather than say a traditional pulled pork replacement way that you see it one new product that I was sent this week was um from Cooks and Co and it's lotus root so apparently it's used a lot in Asian cuisine but it's not kind of big in the west yet that's £2.79 from the uh, the Cooks and Co website or it is available on Amazon as well if you dare to shop at Amazon (laughs) (laughs) if you go over to the dark side Um, but yeah, so it's a little bit more expensive than a tin of jackfruit. But I get so I gave it a go this morning. I googled a recipe for lotus root. Um, it's kind of it looks and and kind of the texture and the look of it is a bit like water chestnut, but it's got like little holes in it. Okay. So um, yeah, I thought water chestnuts I like, but they're kind of bland, aren't they? And obviously watery. Um, yeah. so you know I, I like the crunch of them if I'm cooking Asian food but I'm never kind of like oh you know like must have water chestnuts anyway these were amazing these little pieces of lotus root I was I was really really impressed and I was kind of doing it like 11 o'clock this morning before lunch and ended up eating like <laughs> like a massive stir fry with them I uh, I basically stir fried some garlic and onion in coconut oil I added uh, red pepper the lotus root some a little bit of corn flour to thicken it up with some uh, water and sriracha and tomato ketchup so yeah it was kind of a bit like a sort of sweet and sour style sauce delicious it was really really good yeah I was really impressed with that so there's definitely going to be a new staple in my cupboard 
Um, one reader mentioned recently that we talk a lot about Asian food, but not a lot about Italian, although we did talk about uh, pizzas earlier on, didn't we? But maybe cooking, mm. cooking at home Italian food. Um, I think the reason we talk, talk so much about kind of Asian and curries is because plant based food just really lends itself to those flavors, doesn't it? Definitely really lends itself. And, you know, with these more, let's say, interesting uh, natural meat substitutes like jackfruit, banana blossom, the lotus fruit that you just mentioned, they do really take on the flavors of more traditionally Asian cooking. So I definitely say that was the majority of how we cook in our household as well. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you use as a natural meat replacement if you're making like a bolognese or like a ragu? Lentils we would use. Yeah, I have to say one thing that we rarely buy if at all is is the vegan soy minces it's just not something that I'd say particularly appeals to us it can be quite soft can't it in texture I find some of the ones I've tried have really absorbed the water and swelled up um it's kind yeah it's quite mushy and if I think about eating you know a spaghetti bolognese say um or a similar dish like that actually the last thing I'm interested in is that meaty texture. It is the veggies, the richness of the sauce, maybe some red wine in there, really delicious pasta. Um, so I don't miss the meat at all in a dish like that, which is why I don't feel the need to, to add a soya mince, though I know there's there's many out there if if you do. Yeah, well, I tend to chuck some mushrooms and walnuts in a blender. I think I've mentioned this before on the podcast um, and whiz it all up together. And then you've kind of got the meaty sort of umami flavor of the mushrooms with the crunch of the walnuts. And that's an an amazing mince replacement. Oh, that's a brilliant idea. Um, And when it comes to eating out, well, Prezzo's, the the, uh, restaurant chain, has just launched some more vegan options uh using this they now offer this isn't chicken as part of their range so you can have that as a topping on any of the pizzas which is brilliant so we kind of went out to try this out didn't we last week we did yeah they kindly invited us to try it which was great so what did you go for on the menu so in the interest of research we ordered three mains between two of us (laughs) i'm taking eating for two very seriously at this brilliant well done (laughs) <laughs> um so we ordered the um the chicken pizza so it was the this isn't chicken with a vegan cheese replacement um and peppers on a tomato base and then we also ordered the vegan pepperoni pizza and a vegan meat-free spaghetti bolognese as well lovely yeah I went for the uh, chicken pizza with the uh, red peppers it was absolutely huge really nice base um, the chicken when I first started eating it it was slightly rubbery but then as I kind of got into the dish I kind of got a taste for it then so yeah it was it was good texture not not mushy um, quite firm um, I, personally I don't know whether it needed it I think I'm just happy having natural toppings my my daughter had the I think it was a garlic mushroom vegan pizza which was really good loads of mushrooms on there and the cheeses they use wasn't sort of sticky some of them kind of stick to the roof of your mouth don't they it was Mm. it was a good cheese um what was your bolognese like was nice for a bolognese it was actually really light um it took me a while to figure out whether they had used a meat replacement or not and I think that they had right um, but there was lots of veggies kind of cut up in there which meant that um you know it was still like a nice rich bolognese um lots of flavor lovely pasta as well so um really happy to order that again and it wasn't wasn't heavy going at all with the pizza I agree the texture of the chicken initially was not what I was expecting but um it definitely grew on me as I was as I made my way through the pizza and I really liked that there was that option because quite often in lots of those chains you have a vegan margarita or a vegan pepperoni but actually having a more say Mediterranean flavor or a chicken option is quite different so um yeah kudos to Prezzo for 
having such a investment in their vegan menu yeah definitely did you like the pepperoni I think it's it sort of divides people doesn't it vegan pepperoni it does so for me I wasn't a huge fan however I wouldn't have ordered a pepperoni pizza when I was a meat eater yeah my partner really liked it and said that as far as kind of plant-based pepperonis he tried before including some from more niche uh pizzerias or smaller indie brands he really really liked it so um I think if you're a previous pepperoni lover could be the one for you yeah perhaps it's a a bloke thing I think you know that sort of real meaty pepperoni flavor I don't know maybe that's really sexist (laughs) I have to say as well there was a lot of pepperoni and a lot of chicken on my pizza I don't know if you found that but often even before going vegan with the kind of meat on a topping it can be a bit stingy but there was lots of it so really generous toppings there as well well done prezzos um well let's know what you think and uh, where you kind of like to eat out whether it's italian or any other vegan places you can find us on youtube so you can comment on there or on instagram at simply vegan podcast or at vegan food and living Well, don't go anywhere. Next up, I'll be speaking to to Danae Moore, who is a singer songwriter and a vegan chef. And oh my God, if you haven't had your tea yet, you need to go and get a snack because she really does inspire you and make you feel like cooking up some amazing Jamaican food. She's creating things like king oyster scallops, jerk ribs, patties, and she's, uh, yeah, she's very talented obviously has a real passion for food can't wait to hear this interview this is where vegan cooking vegan food really gets exciting for me well summer has arrived and vegan food and living are offering a trial to their plus membership along with a copy of the magazine delivered to your home in recyclable paper wrap for just one pound You'll also have access to their digital archive, which features every issue of Vegan Food and Living magazine ever published, and you'll receive exclusive discounts with their vegan partners. Give Vegan Food and Living a go for £1 by going to shop.veganfoodandliving.com and entering the code SUMMERVEGAN, no spaces. Nay Moore, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. How are you? How have you been? Yeah, um, I've been pretty busy, which feels really good. I feel like ever since the last, um, was it June the 21st, when things kind of like um, opened up a bit more, I've just been like suddenly like thrown into like all the chaos. Um, Yeah, I think more people have just like put their foot on the gas and everything's kind of like, you know, people are kind of just, um, I mean, I guess we're just able to do more things, especially in this kind of industry, um, food world. Yeah, it's kind of like great being able to do things, isn't it, again, and, you know, go out for dinner and have people round, but then the whole managing your social diary on top of work and everything else, I think it's sort of getting back up to speed with life. It's it's a bit like, whoa, <laughs> take me back to lockdown, take me back to, uh, you, know, you know, not having to, to juggle so much. Anyway, so tell us about Dee's Table. Um, I know you were going to open a restaurant at one point, weren't you? It's kind of been put on the back burner at the moment. Um, we were meant to do the big opening in 2020, um, which to me, to be honest, I think it is what it is. And I will definitely open up for physical space, but um, the timing wasn't quite right. And I kind of wanted to be able to do a lot more and not necessarily have those restrictions. So this past year has been challenging for sure and kind of letting go of that but I think there's been a lot of that. You kind of have to like roll with the punches. And sometimes in the end, actually, I ended up writing a lot of recipes and like working, um, hopefully towards like a cookbook. But um, yeah, just writing a lot, sharing a lot of recipes from home, working with a lot of brands um, and creating things I can share. And I think I wouldn't have been able to do that um, had I kind of kickstarted the restaurant. And it's kind of like, a strange kind of double-edged sword in a way because 
um, when you are like cooking so much for other people, you don't really get to cook for yourself. And I love making food for other people. Um, I actually um, did this dinner yesterday for my friend Rowan, who has this like gallery, amazing gallery called Home. And that was my first time in a while. Well, maybe this year doing something like that, just because I've kind of more transitioned into doing um, kind of more blog focused things. Um, but it felt really good to like do that, but it's been nice to actually sit home, cook for myself, go through recipes, go through ideas, have the time, which felt quite luxurious to actually do all of that. Um, so I think in many ways it's been quite good. Like I feel quite refreshed and geared up to do maybe a couple of pop-ups and stuff to um, get back into it. But um, yeah, I think it's been maybe a blessing in disguise in that respect. Obviously it's been quite, you know, traumatic in, you know, so many people have lost family members and, you know, the isolation part being, not being able to see family, that's been really awful. But in a way, I think it's been good as someone in a creative field. So what what led you to veganism in the first place? I think for me, it started off as curiosity. Um, when I was a teenager, my best friend stopped eating meat and I was kind of like a little bit perplexed by it because I'd never known anyone that done that before. And I remember being like 17 and never ever questioned what I put in my body. Yeah. And was like, oh yeah, like I didn't make the correlation between whether it was ethical to eat meat, whether, you know, even supporting certain kind of industries and the impact on the environment. I never thought about it. Like most people, you wouldn't think about it just because it's the way you've always eaten. Um, so I stopped eating meat just for a little bit, just kind of to try it out because I was like, okay, I've never done this before. My friend's doing it. And I didn't eat meat for like four months. And it was just interesting through that journey. I think from then I kind of stopped, like I was more conscious and aware about when I ate meat and how it made me feel. Yeah. Um, and then I guess like years later with, you know, um, so many different documentaries that were kind of more informative about the impacts on the environment, like documentaries like Earthlands and like um, I read a couple of books about the diet and it's just really like, after that, I just couldn't eat animal products anymore. Yeah, there's no going back, is there, once you've opened the door? <laughs> but I think in many ways, uh, it's interesting because for me, um, in this modern age, I don't think you need to eat meat at all. Um, I think, obviously, that comes from me living in, you know, London or the UK, where the accessibility to lots of different um product not necessarily products but I think my lifestyle in a sense affords me to be able to have control of my diet obviously yeah on a worldwide scale so many people have different circumstances where you know they they aren't afforded of that but um I think in my position um I just felt like I just don't need to do it anymore yeah like it just feels a little bit unnecessary um and I think in many ways I kind of wish more people would just actually think about it because I genuinely don't think people think about where their food comes from, um, where, who like prepared it, like, you know, what is the, when you buy something, the kind of other effect of like what it has on the labour, like the people who are like, you know, um, probably not paid as much to like bring things and this is even on for me as well like products such as I don't know luxurious products such as like coffee or like these things that travel to you like just thinking about that more consciously as well I think is really important outside of veganism to like actually really understand how food comes to you I think it's really important um conversation to have yeah I mean I'm exactly the same I never you like you say you just open up the packet whether it's chicken or yeah. coffee or whatever and you just eat it consume it and away you go and like we were just saying you know life's kind of a million miles an hour you don't have time but I think when you do kind of go down that road and start 
educating yourself and you know reading up on things you're like whoa <laughs> I don't know if I'm okay with this and you know I mean it's even you know slaughterhouse workers I mean they kind of yeah exactly you know a lot of them suffer with depression don't they and you know it's yeah. sort of well documented but you'd never yeah you'd never kind of think about the job that they have to do yeah and it's ironic because I think obviously most people um in the kind of modern world would like I think statistically would have never would never do it themselves or wouldn't even would look at an animal and couldn't even bring it to themselves to do it so I think there's also that question it's like you're paying for something that um like you wouldn't even do it yourself you know yeah so it's like really but I think that is um I think that kind of information or just the analyzing that in a sense, taking power of what you consume, whether that's like digitally, whether it's, you know, TV, like is really powerful when you actually realize that you can have control over that. And I think a lot of people just like you, you know, like we said, are just doing what they've been told, if that makes sense. And we normalize it because it is normalized. It's so normalized to, you know, eat, the way that we do um in you know kind of western world um and we should kind of especially now with the environment and stuff we have to talk about it yeah like it's it's now or never exactly yeah. <laughs> it's really important which is why you know it's great being able to do things like this podcast because hopefully you know it just helps to spread the word and if anyone is sort of curious about veganism then you know hopefully they can kind of pick up a few tips or you know we'll obviously get onto your cooking in a minute which looks amazing <laughs> things like um king oyster scallops uh jerk ribs and patties and where do you get your inspiration from did you did you kind of always love cooking or is this something that's come to yeah, you yeah I always loved cooking um before going vegan but I found when I went vegan I kind of like had to search for the flavors and the ingredients that were gonna, you know, for me to be able to eat the things that I use or dishes that I used to to eat. And I think coming from um, a Jamaican background, um, that was something that instantly I was like, oh my God, like, how do I make like these things that, you know, I, I, I I'm really like, it's something that's a part of me, like I, crave those Jamaican flavors um and it's really funny because it is really easy if you think about it like all spices and herbs are you know plants so that's kind of using those spices the using the fresh kind of flavors the thyme and the scotch bonnet and you know pimento stuff like that that are those are the flavors that sing like with jack chicken you know, jack chicken wouldn't taste like jack chicken without those spices. So in theory, you can carry those things. You're not going to miss out because, you know, all of those things are plants. And I think that's what people don't really connect as well. They kind of think, oh, God, I'm going to miss out on all the flavors. Like you can still like, you know, if, you, if you're craving like any cuisine, Italian food, you know, you, the basil, the tomatoes, the, you know, all of those, the olive oil, like all of those things are like plants. Like, yeah. um, so I think that was an amazing realization and just kind of just exploring using a lot more ingredients in different ways than I probably wouldn't have before. And I think that's why the vegan scene is so exciting because there's almost no rules. Like um, I think now there's a lot more culinary courses and stuff and how to like, um, like I think Cordon Bleu do like a plant-based course, which I think is amazing. Yeah. They're like a, quite a prolific um, cookery school. Um, and that's really awesome that that's accessible. But I feel like for many years, especially when I went vegan, there weren't really things like that. These courses that you can take, um, especially as someone that's interested in food. So then you can take the skills and transfer it and um, open up a restaurant or something like that. Um, so there was a lot of experimenting, especially when I worked my patty recipe originally. That was probably one of the first things I made. I was like, oh, OK, I could do this. Like, um, And I think working from memory of how things tasted and even just like 
the textures as well. I think all of these things, like, I think there's something crazy, like over 20,000 plants on the planet and we only eat like, God, probably less than a fraction of that. Yeah. It's kind of insane. Like plants are infinite. There's only a certain amount of animals that we consume, but the plants are infinite. So it feels like this diet isn't limiting. It's very exciting. There's so much more to explore and to understand and I think that's what excites me by it the most. Yeah, I feel exactly the same, actually. And I know in your interview with Vegan Food and Living, you said about the realising you could make mac and cheese with cashews and it blew your mind. And I thought, yes, that's exactly what I thought. I was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. And like you say, it's just it's, it is infinite what we can do with plants. And it's, it's so clever, isn't it? How do you get the texture then? For example, like the ribs, how do you create a sort of meaty texture? So I was using like mushrooms, I'd shred mushrooms and I'd use like jackfruit. Um, So those, I think jackfruit, I remember for the longest while um, was the kind of go-to thing for a lot of people. But um, you can really manipulate and use it in so many ways to get that kind of like meaty kind of fibrous texture. And I think mushrooms have a lot of flavour and jackfruit kind of is something that takes in you know any kind of sauce or any marinade that you put through it it really soaks up all of that um so there's loads of different there's so many different things and that's what's really like amazing to see year in year out um the new things that come into the world and how people like for instance um with simplicity i don't know if you've tried simplicity's um um vegan um like meat free burgers and they do like meatballs and they work with um dish room at the moment oh, as well okay. yeah i haven't tried that brand but he so he's um neil rankin he's a, like an incredible chef really renowned actually for making um for his kind of meat i think his restaurant is like very barbecue heavy like lots of meat basically yeah. <laughs> not vegan <laughs> at all um and he kind of works on this recipe using fermented vegetables. Oh, wow. And it's insane. So it's all plants, it's all fermented. And the process of the f- fermentation really gives you those like deep, savory, like umami flavors. And he basically just works through it himself. And um, you should definitely try it because you can, um, yeah, he has a few things at um, Dish Room, um, a few of those kind of, restaurants that aren't known for their vegan options but he's kind of a household chef that is kind of doing that on that scale yeah. and using plants which I think is really powerful I think um I'm all for like beyond meat and stuff like I love you know that world of things but I think it's really the next step for me is like using things around you yeah and using the ingredients that are seasonal and he's taking British like produce and like I think he uses pulses mushrooms and different vegetables and ferments them and makes the most amazing like meaty like um substitutes I think that is insane like to me what you can do yeah. with plants you're making me really hungry <laughs> I, <laughs> I absolutely love fermented foods like sauerkraut and stuff so I'll definitely have to check him out and I think like you say the kind of next step once you've kind of gone vegan and worked out how to cook and tried all the sort of more processed options I think hopefully as a society in general you know we will kind of not go down that route where everyone's going plant-based but they're eating a lot of processed food because obviously with from the health angle you know it's not Mm. kind of a great step is it not necessarily a step in the right direction so yeah I think the cooking that you're obviously championing is kind of the way forward so if I wanted to start cooking Jamaican dishes what am I going to need what staples am I going to need in the cupboard I think for me it's allspice right um thyme and scotch bonnet to me are they're like the three like the holy trinity if you if you say like of Jamaican food um pimento and um scotch bonnet are really the base of jerk like especially pimento like traditionally it's cooked on the bark of the tree right. like the they would take the wood almost like if you were to go to like a smokehouse or something like that so you get the real deep smoky flavor so pimento adds that kind of deep smoky flavor to dishes um 
But yeah, I'd say those three things for me. I love fresh thyme. Thyme is so delicious, like thyme and garlic and with mushrooms fried with a bit of pimento would be so delicious. Um, and I use them quite frequently in my house. It's kind of what I've always, in every Jamaican household, like you'd find those things. Yeah, they sound good. Right, I'll have to try out the Scotch bonnet. Is it quite hot? It depends actually, like it's definitely hot. But um, for instance, with like rice and peas, what you do, you um, when you're making the kind of base of it with the kidney beans and the like coconut milk, you add the scotch bonnet whole. Okay. So instead of piercing into it, which when you pierce it, um, all the kind of heat gets released, yeah. it adds this just like aroma. Okay. So it's really nice. Like if you were to make a soup or um, anything that's kind of brothy, um, just put a whole scotch bonnet in but don't slice it open and it doesn't give like any heat it just gives a really nice like aroma like a very like in, a, in the same way as if you put a bay leaf in something yeah. it, like just adds an extra level of aroma and like flavor and sweetness almost um scotch, scotch bonnet is quite versatile in that sense that um you can do it like that I love spice but I've got two children who obviously as most kids are like I don't like this it's too spicy (laughs) so I'll give it a try see if I can get it past them but I think that is a really good way because it's not spicy at all and when you have rice and peas like yeah they you just put a whole scotch bonnet in and it just adds like a nice sweetness and like aroma Mm, yummy what about ackee then do you cook with that yeah I love ackee like Aki traditionally is like served with salt, salt cod, like salt fish, right. um, and had most of the times at like breakfast. Okay. Um, so aki is so delicious. Like the other day, I made aki with artichokes, like um, that were like marinated, and they kind of like when you chop up artichokes um, and fry them in like a bit of um, with thyme and pimento. Um, garlic that kind of thing spring onions um and a bit of sea salt um it really gives the texture of salt fish yeah so that's really nice that's kind of like a really good option um to have with the yaki yaki is really easy to like um, make you basically start everything and then put the yaki on top and steam the yaki and whatever you're cooking so it's often the last thing to add um but yeah super delicious super creamy um, but it's like the national dish so that's one of the things that are like um, I make with like stuff like artichokes or um, I love it with samphire samphire oh, naturally has a kind of saltiness yeah so it's kind of gives gives me that same um, flavor profile as saltfish in a sense yeah. um, it has the like oceany flavor um, so yeah I love 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 aki one of the biggest things as well um, is when you have fresh ackee um, in Jamaica, it's just such a different like level. So in the UK, is it make, do you main, mainly buy in tins? It's not something I've come across before. Yeah, you mainly buy in tins, basically. Like jackfruit. Yeah, but um, it comes in these like amazing little pods. And basically, if they're not opened um they're, they're, it's actually poisonous oh god okay so he also in jamaica if you see them you'd know the aki is ready it releases like a chemical i believe um when it opens and then it's ready to be eaten basically right. but if it's if the pods are still closed then you can't eat it okay that's a good tip <laughs> don't want to poison any listeners <laughs> so i mean is that would you say that's your favorite dish what's what's kind of like you know your go-to I love Aki. Aki, I think, immediately reminds me of like my mum's cooking. Yeah. Because I, her fried dumplings, like you often serve Aki with fried dumplings or um, plantain. Um, and it's normally like a really, like a special treat to me. It was always like a special treat. I'd have it on a Sunday. Like my mum would make it on a Sunday morning. Um, and if I'm missing home, that's why I make. I make Aki. And I make fried dumplings and I like think of my mum. Oh, is she still in Jamaica then? <laughs> no, she lives here. She lives in Stratford, but I live in Margate, which is not that far away. It's like one, an hour and a, and a bit um, out of London. Um, but during the pandemic, especially, I was making a lot of acne yeah. when I wasn't able to, <laughs> to actually see her. 
Aki in a Zoom instead was sort of the <laughs> next yeah. thing. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. So do you do you go to Jamaica a lot? Or I mean, obviously not the past sort of year or so, but do you do you kind of go back there for holidays or to visit family? Yeah, I try to. Um, I think normally it's kind of like once every two years. Um, I'm hoping that I can go sometime soon. Um, but it's just like a different, like for me, it feels like vegan heaven in a way right. to be that close to tropical fruit and vegetables, which I definitely took for granted growing yeah. up. Um, Cause I feel like I kind of just normalized having like three different types of mango trees in my garden. <laughs> I'm not really thinking that, not realizing that that wasn't, I mean, that was just, how I grew up I grew up so closely to to eating seasonally eating you know what is around me and eating them at its peak and I think a lot of people who are close to produce are in tune with that and I think maybe that's the missing thing here as well I think um if you can introduce kids to that sense of seasonality like even picking strawberries peak season um I think that would have that connection with you know how it gets to you and then you know eating it and you'd feel that connection to the food more and the plant more um so when I go back to Jamaica like having all of those things having the ackee fresh and stuff like that you know it's just like it's vegan heaven to me um in that respect so it's the the kind of diet over there a lot of you know a lot of plant-based foods just with some kind of chicken and ribs thrown in yeah I would say so um I think even a lot of the times my mum would make food without any meat. Um, and I think, yeah, you're eating a lot of fresh fruit. Yeah. Like I think it goes with the climate as well. Like yeah. it's amazing what um, nature gives you, you know, in certain climates to kind of not heal, but to nurture you. Yeah. And I think because it's so hot, like um, the weather's hot, you want to have, you know, a fresh mango and, I think that's what's amazing is like seasonally how things grow in the perfect time. Yeah. Yeah. We really have become sort of disconnected, haven't we, with our food systems, I think over here anyway. So yeah, it's, um, I think it's a really good point sort of trying to reconnect our kids with these things, even if it's growing something small. I'm currently looking out of my window at the gray <laughs> clouds and thinking about <laughs> Jamaica and all the mangoes. I'm like, Oh my God. <laughs> So your your local community in you're in London or Margate? Margate. Okay. I live in Margate. Yeah. yeah. So if your sort of friends and family there, have they embraced kind of plant based eating, or is it has it been a sort of a slow burner? I think actually it's quite it's quite um, accessible. In I mean, London is so easy. Yeah. Like you don't even have to think about it. You just go anywhere almost, and you're likely to be okay. But I think what is what is really changing now is chefs are kind of like exploring that and doing more things. Like I went to this restaurant in well in London called Joy recently, right. and they've done something with simplicity. But they're like an Italian kind of it's, it feels kind of very um, British European um, kind of vibe, and they have the most beautiful um, vegan dishes. And I think that is like a great step like and good to see because I feel like many years ago that wasn't really normally a thing like a restaurant like that um would have wouldn't have necessarily had vegan options and I think people like Neil Rankin who's like you know such a credible chef and highly respected is doing the vegan food now is doing the things and even um oh god really amazing chef Tom oh oh not, it's not coming to me not right now. Carriage. Yeah, Tom Carriage. <laughs> he actually just opened. I, I got an email about it, which is quite funny. Um, but he just opened a vegan, mostly vegan. So it's not all vegan, but I think it's like something like 85% of the menu is entirely vegan. Oh my god. Which is amazing. I think um beyond that's really helpful because obviously I think for most people, I think globally, I don't think we'll go completely completely vegan but you know if a chef like him and you know Neil Rankin these people who I don't think are vegan themselves 
are doing those things, are introducing vegan, you know, food in their restaurants, are making mostly vegan menus. I think that's when things are going to change. And I've noticed that in Margate as well, like a lot of the, pretty much most of the restaurants um, bar like a steakhouse or something like yeah. ridiculous, um, have a couple of vegan dishes are really well made. There's not an afterthought. It's not like, you know, a couple of leaves on a plate. or Bean chilli. You know, like <laughs> not the bean chilli again. Um, <laughs> um, there's some really innovative dishes and people doing amazing things and yeah like I said it's not an afterthought and there's a place in Margate at the moment called Forts right and they do kind of more breakfasty lunch kind of things really really amazing food what they're doing and um, really fresh produce using a lot of seasonality so that the ingredients and dishes change pretty weekly based on what they were able to get. So I think that style of cooking is happening a lot more. And I think people are generally more conscious about it. And it's what I do with these table. Like I often never really do the same thing twice. Right. Um, Just based on those, those things. I think I'm always excited by seasonality and inspired by what is fresh. Like right now I'm crazy about strawberries and the elderflower. So I've been making a lot of strawberry elderflower jam or like, you know, incorporating stuff like that into um dishes or recipes um but I think that kind of cooking is like really singing at the moment and it's really important and um pivotal right now to see the bigger chefs who aren't vegan um introducing like vegan dishes in their restaurants yeah I can't believe Tom Kerridge because I mean he was on TV the other day and he was doing really sort of traditional British meat heavy dishes I think he was doing like pork and something or other and I kind of turned it over so I'll definitely be googling that after (laughs) after our chat because um that yeah that's incredible yeah and I believe as well it's more plant heavy it's more plant focused so it's not like um as much faux meat or anything it's using a lot more British produce and I think it's 85% 85% vegan which is really amazing like, for a restaurant of his caliber oh well thank you so much Danae so if anyone wants to find out more about Dee's Table I mean are you running supper clubs at the moment um I'm doing a couple of pop-ups over the summer so I'll probably be sharing the information on my Instagram and um, doing more physical things um which is exciting um so yeah mainly on my Instagram is where I kind of um, share news and like what I'm doing next yeah so that's at D's table is that right on Instagram at D's underscore table brilliant well that's it for this week's episode thanks for listening and in the meantime as always please do drop us a review on your platform of choice don't forget you can comment on our videos on YouTube and follow us on social media at simply vegan podcast and at vegan food living Next week, I'll be joined by our new digital assistant on Vegan Food and Living, Molly Pickering. And I'll also be speaking to Lauren Lovett, founder of the Plant Academy and Feed Your Mind Candy. 